Well, welcome to the Board of County Commissioners public meeting. It's Wednesday, September 9th, in the year 2015, approximately 1.35 in the afternoon. Uh, with that, please uh, stand and say the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible. Next, we have an opportunity for public announcements. Anything to announce? Nope. Okay. Public comment. Is there any public comment about anything that's not on today's agenda? Public comment. Seeing none, we'll move to the current claims list which is $6,077,647.54. Next, we have a hearing on the Certificate of Survey of Judy Peterson Family Transfer. Thank you, Commissioners. For the record, my name is Christine Desenzo with Community and Planning Services. And today we have four family transfers, the first of which is Judy Peterson's uh, request. Um, she owns 34.1 acres in Paddy, Creek, Paddy Canyon, excuse me, and she's proposing to use the family transfer exemption to create and transfer two parcels to her adult children, um, both of which are 11.3 acres. Um, Lisa Beard and Eric Peterson are the recipients and plan to use uh, both parcels as home sites. Uh, the remainder tract will also be 11.3 acres. Uh, this request is compliant with uh, the zoning. It is, the parcel is split zoned and you can see here that line dividing um, a section of the northern part of the parcel which will be um, part of tract one, and that is in zoning district four, which allows for a minimum lot size of three acres with one dwelling per five acres. Uh, the southern portion of the parcel will make up uh, part of tract one and then all of tracts two and three. And that zoning uh, requires a minimum lot size of two acres and the proposal is compliant with that zoning. Uh, as for the parcel history, the parcel was created uh, most recently in February of 2015 in the current configuration when Judy Peterson went through a boundary line relocation. Um, and that included parcels uh, in government lot three and tract two of the COS on the screen. That's COS 1858, um, or sorry, 6450. And in 1979, when Gary Peterson went through a family transfer to create uh, Tract 4D, show, shown in this uh, COS as 1858. And then in 1977, uh, the Chrismans uh, created Tract 4 through large lot exemption, and that is uh, COS 1096. Uh, as for access and the structures on the parcel, um, the proposed lots will be accessed via Larch Camp Road to the south, and there appears to be one, oh, sorry, appears to be one structure on the CAMA data, uh, or on the aerial, but the CAMA data wasn't available for this parcel, and it um, appears to be a burn, burn down structure. Let me see if I can, oh, I don't have a close up of it, but um, that appears to be the only structure, and it is also located outside the floodplain. Uh, it was reviewed for evasion criteria and triggered three uh, to divide a track that was created through use of exemption. Um, as we talked about previously, it went through a boundary line relocation in the beginning of this year and a family transfer and large lot exemption. Uh, and also to divide a tract which will become one of three or more parcels that will be divided from the original tract. So this parcel will create uh, three parcels from one and to divide tracts uh, by an applicant who has used exemptions in the past. And so Judy was involved in that boundary line relocation. 
Um, but it does not appear that this request um, is an attempt to evade subdivision, so we are recommending approval. And at this time, I would ask Judy to approach the podium, and we'll go over those standard family, question, family transfer questions. Hi. And can you state your name for the record? Uh, yes, Judy A. Peterson. Thank you. Um, are you using the subdivision exemption process in an attempt to evade subdivision review? No. And how long have you owned the property? Approximately two years. And did you buy the property with the intent of dividing it? No. Do you or your transferees intend to transfer the property within the next year? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Have you talked to anyone at the county about going through subdivision review? Um, no. If it was a possibility, you can say yes to that okay. if it was a possibility. <laughs> but no. No. Okay. Um, and are you in the business of building or developing property? No. And do you understand that this exemption is not being reviewed for adequate physical and legal access by all vehicles in all weather? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and do you understand that the that this approval uh, that approval of this exemption does not mean the property is approved for zoning compliance, building permits, floodplain septic permits, or any other permits? And um, in the sort of mind frame of the recipient, um, will the property be developed? The transferred parcels. Um, at this. At this stage, there is nothing. Um, Do they intend to build a home or develop it in any way? Um, to my knowledge, not at this point, but perhaps down the road. Okay. Uh, one of my children lives here. The other one is in Colorado. So. Okay. Um, and so one lives here and one is in Colorado. That Correct. was my third question. No, okay. Third, last question. Okay. Uh, and so there's potential for development. Potential, okay. yes. Correct. Um, will the recipient of the property be residing on the property? Not in the immediate future. Okay. So those are all of my questions. The commissioners may have more for you or discussion items. Anything? Questions? Sure. Mrs. Peterson, um, it seemed like there was some confusion. We were guessing about what structures might be on there and if one burned down or whatever, just by looking at an old event. Yes, so you want to tell there, us? there is a foundation, and um, I'm trying to think of the name. Just one second. So you do you remember the people who owned the property years ago with the foundation? Mm -hmm. um, maybe Bog Myers or oh, something? Bar Myers. Bar, and, and I believe that their foundation, it, it was a fire. And so the foundation is still there. Um, right now we have um, kind of wired it and put, you know, flagging just to make sure that no one, you know, goes close to it. But that's the only structure that is on that property. Okay, so you bought it because you like it, but nobody lives there right now. Nobody lives there, and the, um, it's uh, attached to the property where we now live. So it was just, it, it came up for sale. And it was just, you know, really convenient for us because of the, um, you know, the area being so close to ours. So, thank you. Um, thanks. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Does anybody among the public care to ask a question or make a comment? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing. Is there a motion? I would move that the Board of County Commissioners approve the request by Judy, Judy Peterson to create and transfer two parcels by the use of family transfer exemption based on the fact there does not appear to be an attempt to evade subdivision review. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. You'll be getting a notice uh, that we took this action in several weeks or so. Thank you. All right, next up is a, another family transfer, Terry Hoke. Or is it Hokey? Uh, I believe it's, is it Hoke? Hoke? OK. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so this is, uh, for the record, again, my name is Christine Desenzo with Community and Planning Services. Um, this is a consideration for a family transfer exemption affidavit submitted by Terry Hoke, um, who owns 4.85 acres in West Missoula. 
Um, the proposal is to use the family transfer exemption to create and transfer one parcel to uh, their adult child, one acre to Jarrett Hoke for use as a home site. Uh, the remainder tract would be 3.85 acres. And so it would be that northern portion that would be transferred. Um, it is compliant with zoning. It's uh, zoned CRR1 with a density of one dwelling per acre. Uh, bah, bah, bah. And the parcel history, in 1982, Jer Janet Bryant went through an agricultural, agricultural exemption on the neighboring parcel to the south, so this M1 portion. Um, and that is shown in COS 2785. It also went through a mortgage exemption in 1978, creating this parcel here, um, which uh, does not really impact the proposal. Um, they're transferring a different portion of that. Um, so the parcel access is shared access easement off of uh, Council Way. There is one dwelling on the property, which was built in 1979, and one outbuilding, which was also built in 1979. It's located inside the floodplain, um, and you can see that here. The southern portion is within the floodplain. Um, the county is recommending that that is shown on the plat, on the final plat, um, but it should not impact the transferred parcel, and there are no new structures proposed in, uh, the, within the floodplain. Um, it was reviewed for the subdivision evasion criteria and triggered one, um, which was to divide a tract that was created through use of an exemption. And so we have that uh, 1982 mortgage exemption and the 1978 mortgage exemption. Well, or, sorry, well, not, uh, agricultural well, exemption. Don't trust the PowerPoint. Um, sorry about that. So we are recommending approval, but before I get to that, we can go over the standard questions for family transfer. If Terry would approach the podium. And if you could state your name for the record. Terry Hoke. Thank you. Um, and are you using this subdivision exemption process as an attempt to evade subdivision review? No. Thanks. And how long have you owned the property? Uh, 27 years. Thank you. And did you buy the property with the intent of dividing it? No. You had a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> Do you or your transferees intend to transfer the property within the next year? Excuse me? Do you or your transferees intend to no. transfer it? Um, and do you, have you talked with anyone at the county about going through subdivision review? Are you in the business of building or developing property? Nope. And do you understand that this exemption is not being reviewed for adequate physical legal access uh, by all vehicles in all weather? Yes. Do you understand that approval of this exemption does not mean that the property is approved for zoning compliance, building permit, floodplain, septic systems, or any other permits? Um, and uh, as for the recipients, do you know if the property will be developed? No. Mm -hmm. He wants to build a house. Okay. He wants to start tomorrow, but I don't think we can do that. <laughs> okay. And will the recipient, you may have already answered this, but will the recipient of the property be residing on the property? Yes. Okay. And where does the recipient live now? Um, right now, Actually, because it's summertime, he lives at my house. Okay, thank you. And that is it for my questions, but the commissioners may have more. Any questions, Mr. Hope? No questions. You're, thank you very much. You're welcome. This is when a can we start? <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask John that in a minute. <laughs> Uh, this is a public hearing or is there are there any questions or comments about this transfer? None. Thank you. I'll close the hearing. I move that the Board of County Commissioners approve the request by Terry Hoke to create and transfer one parcel by use of the family transfer exemption based on the fact that there does not appear to be an attempt to evade subdivision review. Second. All in favor? Aye.
So you can, because it's approved today, it's official today, right, John? Yeah, I'm grab tool So you can have the survey be done and, and um, you know, the public works, you'd have to get a building permit, but public works can check with us, to, with our office, to make sure that it's been approved. You should be able to start. And you're welcome to leave if you'd like. You don't have to stay. You can stay if you'd like, but we won't. And do you know where our public works department is? Out past the airport on Training Drive. That's where they get building permits. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is the new one. Ah, congratulations. All right. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have another hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Another hearing of the Roy Wills family transfers. And so we are um, doing, there are two family transfer requests from uh, Roy Wills, and we'll do them individually. Uh, this, uh, and for the record, my name is Christine Desenzo with Community and Planning Services. And this is a consideration of a family transfer exemption affidavit submitted by Roy O. Wills, and he owns 27.45 acres in Potomac, south of the highway. Um, he is proposing to use the family transfer exemption to create and transfer three parcels to his adult children, 8.5 acres to Roy G. Wills, three acres to Jennifer Wills, three acres, oh, four acres to Jennifer Wills, and three acres to Brandy Hamilton um, for use as home sites. And the remainder tract will be uh, 12 acres. The property is unzoned and uh, therefore is compliant with zoning. Uh, the land use recommendation is open and resource um, with a density of one dwelling per 40 acres from the 2002 Regional Land Use Guide. Uh, the parcel history, um, this parcel was created in 1985 when Roy Beulah and William Wills went through a larger uh, division of land larger than 20 acres. <coughs> Sorry, I did not include that COS, but that is COS 3229. Um, and the, uh, if approved, the proposed lots would be accessed by Blixit Creek Road. There appear to be two existing dwellings uh, per the affidavit and the aerials, um, and then four outbuildings, uh, which were built in 1983, and then three were built in 1973. It is located within zone D of the floodplain, which uh, basically means that it has not been mapped and is an undetermined risk, but that's noted for the record. And it was reviewed for evasion criteria and triggered three uh, to divide a tract that was created through use of an exemption, to divide a tract which uh, will become one of three or more parcels to be divided from the original tract, and to divide tracts uh, by an applicant who has used exemptions uh, to create parcels from the original tract or other tracts. Um, but as it does not appear to uh, be an attempt to evade subdivision review, uh, we are recommending approval. Um, and at this time, Roy, if you could approach the podium. We'll ask the standard family transfer questions. Thank you. And could you both state your name for the record? Roy Wills. Uh, uh, Jason Wills. And how long have you owned the property? Uh, about 30 years. If, you, if I can, I'd like to have your direct questions to him. I don't hear him real well, but he, he can answer me over and say Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, and did you buy the, did he buy the property with the intent of dividing it? It's been in my family for years. No. Okay. And do you or your transferees intend to transfer the property within the next year? Have you talked to anyone at the county about going through subdivision review? Are you in the business of building or developing property? So I don't know if we're picking that up at the microphone. Yeah. Try to speak louder if you can, please. No. Those last responses have been no's. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, do you intend 
or do you understand that this exemption is not being reviewed for adequate physical and legal access by all vehicles in all weather? Yes. Uh, do you understand that approval of this exemption does not mean the approval, the property is approved for zoning compliance, building permit, floodplain, or septic systems, or any other permits? Yes. Thanks. And as the recipient, will the property be developed? Will the properties be, be developed? No. no. Probably, no. Um, probably not within, um, if they do, it's going to be after they retire and move uh, for a year so okay. to say may maybe mm -hmm. but <laughs> sure. down the road. So We'll tie you to that. <laughs> Um, will the recipient of the property be residing on the property? If so, okay. yes. Okay. And where do the recipients live now? Okay, so... Okay, so uh, Roy G. Wills lives in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, Jennifer Wills lives in Bozeman, Montana. And uh, right now, Patsy Hamilton lives in Washington. State? The state of okay. Washington, yes. Okay, that is it for my questions. The commissioners may have more. Thank you. Any questions? No? Looks like we're good to go on this one. Okay. It is a public. Oh, I've got the oh. more slides for that. It is a public hearing. Is, are there any comments or questions from the public? Seeing none, I'll close the hearing. Is there a motion? I would move that the Board of County Commissioners approve the request by Roy Wills to create and transfer three parcels by the use of the family transfer exemption based on the fact there does not appear to be an attempt to evade subdivision review. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. There's one down. <laughs> And for the record, my name is Christine DeCenza with Community and Planning Services. <laughs> and this will be a consideration of a family transfer with a boundary line relocation submitted by Roy O. Wills, who owns an additional 305.6 acres in Potomac. And this brings us north of the highway. Um, and Roy Wills proposes to use the family transfer and boundary line relocation exemptions to create and transfer three uh, parcels to his adult children, 70 acres to Royce Conlin, uh, 80 acres to Jason Wills, and 80 acres to Victoria Godkin uh, for use as home sites. The remainder tract will be 75.6 acres. Uh, it is, this parcel is also compliant with, zo with zoning due to the fact that it is unzoned. Um, there is a land use recommendation of one dwelling per 40 acres in the open and resource um, land use designation from the 2002 Regional Land Use Guide. Uh, and for the parcel history, the parcel went through a, uh, was created in 2002 when Roy Wills went through, uh, Roy O. Wills went through a boundary line relocation on COS 5069. As for the um, access, if approved, the proposed lots would be accessed via existing and future uh, private roads off Highway 200. There are no dwellings on the property and no outbuildings. Um, it is also located within FEMA Zone D with undetermined flood risks. If the water gets us high, we better have an arm. <laughs> um, and the request was reviewed for subdivision evasion based on 10 criteria from the subdivision regulations and triggered three to divide a tract that was created through use of exemptions, uh, to divide a tract which will become one of three or more parcels that will be divided from the original tract through use of exemptions, and to divide tracts uh, by an applicant who has used exemptions in the past. Um, but as it does not appear to be an evasion of subdivision review, staff is recommending approval. And I would ask uh, Roy and Jason to approach the podium one more time 
and we'll go over that same set of questions, but for this parcel, these parcels. Um, and state your name for the record. Jason Wills. Roy Wills. Thank you. And are you using the subdivision exemption process, in this case, in an attempt to evade subdivision review? No. Thank you. Uh, how long have you owned these two pieces of property? About 30 years. Thanks. Did you buy the property with the intent of dividing it? It was well to me from my folks. In other words, no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, do you or your transferees intend to transfer the property within the next year? No. Have you talked to anyone at the county about going through subdivision review? No. Are you in the business of building or developing property? No. Do you understand that this exemption is not being reviewed for adequate physical and legal access by all vehicles in all weather? And do you understand that uh, approval of this exemption does not mean the property is approved for zoning compliance, building permit, uh, floodplain, or septic systems, or any other permits? Yes. Thank you. And uh, as for the recipients, uh, will the property being transferred be developed? Uh, eventually, again, once mm -hmm. everybody retires, probably. <laughs> And will the recipients of the properties be residing on the properties at that time? Yes. And where do they live now? Alaska. All yeah. three? Uh, no, nope. except I, I live mm -hmm. here in Missoula. Okay. And Vicki lives in Juneau, Alaska, and Royce lives in Fairbanks, Alaska. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, that is all of my, uh, that those are all of my questions, and the commissioners may have more questions. Nope. Good. Thank you. I just think that we should, probably should state on the record that um, all the properties in Potomac, the paperwork says mm -hmm. Bonner because that's the mailing address. Mm -hmm. So just in case someone happens to look at these and would be confused, there's no post office in Potomac anymore. I might add, uh, my mother was a Potomac postmaster for years until she retired, then we became Bonner. Nothing changed, nothing moved. Oh. I'll be darned. Well, this is a public hearing. Uh, any comments, questions about this from the public? Seeing none, I'll close the hearing. I move that the Board of County Commissioners approve the request by Roy Wills for a boundary line relocation and to create and transfer three parcels by use of the family transfer exemption based on the fact that there does not appear to be an attempt to evade subdivision review. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. You'll get notice that we took this action in, in a couple weeks or so, I think. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have a hearing on the Lang Mormon Creek Open Space Bond Project. Good afternoon, commissioners and everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Ritchie and I'm a project manager with Five Valleys Land Trust. And I'm here today to um, request just under $14,000 of open space bond funding uh, to cover the transaction costs of a fully donated conservation easement. It's in a Lolo area. Um, Bob Lang is the landowner, who you all met um, when you visited the property. 
He's owned this rural agricultural property since 1952, and he would like to see it kept intact and minimally developed. Um, Five Valleys has been working with him over the past year to craft a conservation easement that will protect those open space values of his property. Um, it's an important goal for him, and so rather than um, selling a conservation easement on the property as you often see in these open space bond projects, he would like to fully donate the conservation easement. Um, the request that we're making to the Missoula County Open Space Bond Program is for the transaction costs of completing this, this project and doing the conservation easement. <clears throat> um, a little bit about the property and its open space values. Um, the property is located just southwest of Lolo, uh, about three miles up Mormon Creek Road. It's a really diverse property with a lot of conservation values um, on those 200 acres. There's about a half a mile of Mormon Creek flowing through the property. Uh, there's a, ver a robust and varied riparian area associated with that that's important for a number of terrestrial wildlife species and then also home to West Slope cutthroat trout. Um, there's a lot of agriculturally productive bottomland um, on the property pictured here and it includes um, about 70 acres of soils that are ranked as important by uh, natural resource conservation services. About 30, 30 of those acres are prime if irrigated and another 40 acres are ranked as locally important soils. Um, there are also uh, two north-south ridges um, on the property. Here's pictured one, the um, western ridge on the property. And these are important for, these run from the Bitterroot foothills to the south and then north towards Lolo Creek and then the mountains beyond to the north. Um, fair amount of wildlife movement on these ridges as they move out of the Bitterroot Mountains and down toward Lolo Creek. And then this area, the property is also in an area that's identified as important for wildlife linkage between the northern Sapphire Mountains and then the, the northern Bitterroot Mountains. Um, the, and then the two ridge lines of the property are also highly visible right from downtown Lolo as we saw and then also from a good portion of Highway 93 and then a little bit of Highway 12 as well. So Five Valleys has been working with um, Bob Lang over the last year on the conservation easement and it would allow for one new residence um, in addition to his existing home and then it will prohibit any subdivision of this property. Um, and you can see it's, it's uh, three parcels there. <clears throat> so the transaction costs of completing this conservation easement um, include title research and insurance, uh, minerals research, a baseline inventory of the property, um, the closing and recording fees, and then a stewardship fee, which, which ensures that perpetual monitoring and enforcement of the conservation easement. Um, Five Valleys has worked with the county staff to develop um, a grant agreement uh, for the stewardship portion of the contribution that would just guide, describe and, and guide the use of those funds and restrict it to just that, that stewardship. Um, Five Valleys is really grateful for the gift, for, for the generosity of the landowner in fully uh, donating the conservation easement. And then he has, has expressed gratitude, Bob Lang, that there is a county open space bond program to come to and ask for help in, in making this happen and completing this. So it's, there's a lot of appreciation there. So. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, county commissioners. I'm Kaylee Becker with Missoula County Community and Planning Services, and I have a brief staff report on the Lang Mormon Creek project. This project proposes to use up to $13,850 of open space bond funding on transaction costs of a fully donated conservation easement on 204 acres of land near Lolo, Montana that is owned by Bob Lang. Five Valleys Land Trust would hold the conservation easement on this property. On July 15, 2015, the Board of County Commissioners determined the project is a qualified open space project by adopting reimbursement resolution 2015-80, which qualifies the project for open space bond funding. Missoula County 
Open Lands Citizen Advisory Committee met on July 16, 2015 and voted unanimously to recommend this project for approval. And they ranked it highest in terms of scenic historic values and proposed funding. The 2007 interlocal agreement related to the open space bond established the uh, general purposes of the open space bond and this project meets the following purposes. Protecting the water quality of streams, protecting wildlife habitat, providing open space and scenic landscapes, conserving working ranches, farms, and forests, and managing for growth. And a few unique and noteworthy aspects of this project, which some of which were mentioned by Sarah in her presentation, the 204 acres that would be placed under conservation easement are largely undeveloped and contain important farmland soils. The property has been used for agricultural purposes since it was homesteaded, and the conservation easement will allow agricultural uses to continue. There is currently only one residential structure on the property, and one additional structure will be allowed that will be near Mormon Creek Road. Mormon Creek also runs through the property and it supports a healthy and diverse riparian area, which is important to water quality and aquatic habitat for native bull trout and cutthroat trout, both of which are present in Mormon Creek. In terms of proposed funding, the, as Sarah mentioned, the $13,850 would be used solely on transaction costs since the land landowner is generously donating the full value of the conservation easement. This works out to an amount of $68 of open space bond funding per acre. Staff recommends approval of this project and as shown in the draft approval resolution, which is attachment C, there is one condition of approval for this project which is that a separate grant agreement between Five Valleys Land Trust and the county is signed and recorded prior to the release of open space bond funds if this project is approved. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Not at this point. Thanks. Thanks. This is a public hearing. Could somebody care to speak to this? Hi. Is there a button here to push? No. Okay, my name is Andy Hayes and I'm on the Open Lands Committee. Uh, I also went up and looked at this project and I'm here to comment on the screaming good deal I think this is for Missoula County and for the use of our open space bond fund money. The fact that it was a totally donated easement with only the transaction costs and the future monitoring of the land makes this a really good deal. And if, if you also went to see it, you would realize the high potential for development on one of the ridges there. So again, I'll speak in favor of you uh, offering this open lands money to the Lang, Mr. Lang. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else care to speak to this? Anyone else? Seeing no one, we'll close the hearing. Discussion, motion? I would move that the Board of County Commissioners authorize bond funding expenditure of up to $13,850 toward the transaction costs of a fully donated conservation easement on approximately 204 acres for the Lang Mormon Creek project with the condition that prior or concurrent with the release of funds, a grant agreement with Missoula County is recorded establishing the use of funds for the long-term protection and enforcement of the conservation easement. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you for doing this work and putting this together. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the field trip. And the field trip, yeah. Okay. One last hearing here. It looks like Missoula County Subdivision Regs rewrite. Thank you. All right. 
Uh, for the record, I'm Mitch Doherty. I'm a planner with Community Planning Services. Today I'm, to, I'm here to present on the proposal to amend section 3.13 in the natural and cultural environment section. Soon to possibly be retitled hazardous lands. <clears throat> See, you've probably seen these next few slides a few times before, but I just wanted to go over our process uh, one last time, hopefully, here. Um, in terms of the rewrite project, um, this is what we've accomplished to date so far in the, in the top section here. Tim Worley's brought through the review procedures section in Article 5. Uh, Jenny Dixon brought through Section 3.2, Lots and Blocks, and 3.12, Primary Travel Corridors in Article 3. And most recently, Tim Worley brought through Transportation and Infrastructure. Um, that section is in Article 3. And again, I'm here today to speak about the uh, Hazardous Lands Section 3.1. And sometime down the road, you'll probably see me again to um, bring forward a proposal on agriculture and agricultural water users, which will also be included in this section of the subdivision regulations. So more specifically, this is the vision for Article 3. Um, as you can see, Article, sorry, Section 3.1 is expanding to include several new sections. Um, and we're basically moving some of these into 3.1 because it just kind of makes sense. Um, those include hazardous lands, agriculture, agricultural water, riparian resource areas and wildlife. And the last two, riparian resource areas and wildlife, will be a little further down the road. So CAPS has organized an adoption and effective date process to work through most of Article 3 without too many hiccups, we hope. The way this works is that we'll move several interconnected sections of Article 3 through the public process, which includes adoption. We've established an effective date of November 2nd so that the interconnected sections take effect on the same day to avoid any conflicts um, with renumbering and moving, moving text all at once. So it's possible also that some renumbering may need to take place a little bit further down the road once we get things all organized into Section 3.1. So this past winter, staff, along with our consultant team, began the conceptual phase of this portion of the rewrite project. We reviewed the current standards and looked at ways to improve what we currently have in terms of standards and regulations for hazardous lands. We also looked around the country to see what was working in other communities and compared that with our public needs. On June 8, 2015, we released the first public draft. Following the release of that draft, we held several Q&A question and answer sessions around the county four of those um, here in Missoula, also in Sealy Lake and Frenchtown. Um, the first draft was out for public comment for roughly a month. Um, and following the closing of that comment period, we began work on the public hearing draft you're considering today. Planning Board also held a hearing on this proposal on August 4th, which I'll cover in a little bit. So why is Section 3.13 important? Um, number one, the county needs to protect public health, safety, and welfare. The county also wants to protect private and public investments as well. These goals can be achieved by minimizing the risk. And how do we do that? The easiest way is to start by avoiding hazardous areas altogether. In the instances where ha a hazard can be overcome, the regulations can provide meaningful mitigation to help achieve that. A lot of people think that best management practices are a way to improve environmental quality of some sort, but in the context of hazardous lands, BMPs or best management practices not only help to minimize risk and protect residents' investments, but the long-term implementation of BMPs can help to lessen the financial burden on taxpayers for disaster relief for events such as flooding and wildfire. So what's being proposed is fairly straightforward. Um, currently, the regs regulations only provide a list of potential hazards and require the developer to mitigate the hazard without clear guidance on how to do that. The proposed amendments, amendments under consideration include defining the hazardous areas and providing clear mitigation options. The proposal also includes specific guidance on hazards, including wildfire and flooding. Ancillary changes are being proposed to Section 2.2, including definitions for terms such as defensible space, slope, and stream. Section 7.5 includes amendments for submittal requirements for both preliminary plat applications and final plat submittal. 
As I mentioned earlier, the current regulations only include a list of hazards and the requirement to mitigate those hazards. This draft proposes to define those hazards to provide more clarity for the users. Once it's known what the potential hazards are that need to be considered, a developer needs to identify those hazards within the project area and delineate those hazards in the application. The proposed regulations prohibit development of building structures, infrastructure, except for the Board of County Commissioners approve mitigation that can overcome that hazard. If it's possible to overcome a hazard with mitigation, the regulations provide op options and alternatives, including building envelopes, no build zones, geotechnical studies, fencing, and alternative proposals um, that a developer may have. So for hazards such as wildfire, we have better guidance on proven mitigation that's appropriate for subdivisions. The proposal includes a change from the current process where we rely heavily on the wildland urban interface map to determine if there is a wildfire hazard that requires mitigation. The proposal in front of you today includes a two-step process to identify a wildfire hazard. The first step includes review of the property in relation to the wildland urban interface map included within the community wildfire protection plan. If the property is located within the wildland urban interface, then a developer could move on to step two. Step two is the site-specific fire hazard assessment. The assessment considers elements such as access, vegetation, water supply, building material, and building materials. If the subject property is located within the wildland urban interface and is found to have a fire hazard severity rating of moderate or above in the assessment, then the fire hazard area standards would kick in. So some additional notes on the wildland urban interface map and the assessment form. Um, we know that the wildland inter urban interface map is not the best tool for this type of analysis, but it's what we have to work with right now. Um, the wildland urban interface map was created for the purpose of defining where the uninhabited forest area meets the residential areas. And basically it's used, currently used as a tool to obtain funding for fuels reduction work. The wildland urban interface map doesn't describe or portray the risk or severity of a wildfire hazard, so it cannot be solely relied upon, relied upon to trigger the wildfire hazard area standards. Our hope is that with the forthcoming update to the community wildfire protection plan, the county may also obtain a fire hazard severity map in that process that can be used during sub the subdivision review process. As for the fire hazard assessment form, uh, staff created this form based on the International Code Council's fire hazard severity form, which is found in the Wildland and Urban Interface Codebook. Staff looked at what other communities across the West were using to identify the wildfire hazard area, and in most instances, we found that communities are using a combination of a fire hazard map and a fire hazard assessment form. And for the most part, communities were using a fire hazard assessment and form form that included the same criteria and scale found in the International Code Council's fire hazard severity form. Staff is proposing a reduction in requirements for defensible space from what's currently in the regulations. The proposal eliminates defensible space requirements for newly created lots and only requires defensible space for critical infrastructure such as roads and water facilities. While we recognize that it is not ideal to be reducing de defensible space requirements at a time when we are witnessing large explosive wildfires, staff recognizes that a requirement for perpetual defensible space maintenance in the subdivision regulations is not the appropriate place to address that type of mitigation. Standalone ordinances or possibly zoning code that addresses hazardous, hazardous fuels is a better way to approach fuels mitigation. This was noted in the University of Montana Law Clinic's report that analyzed the wildland urban interface regulations and was confirmed by staff's research of other community, communities' defensible space regulations throughout the western United States. Building construction requirements for roofing have also been eliminated. These types of standards are better suited for building codes, which uh, the Department of Labor may be adopting shortly. This section also includes a notification requirement to put future lot owners on notice of the hazards associated with living in a fire hazard area and notifying them of their responsibilities for maintaining the defensible space around critical infrastructure. <clears throat> the flood hazard area standards is another section where we have a plethora of guidance for development of the flood hazard area and appropriate mitigation measures to ensure public health to ensure the public's health, safety, and welfare. 
The proposal includes requirements that prohibit any alteration of the floodplain. The section is carried over from the current regulations. The proposal also includes standards that require the developer to look at the land division history deter to determine if the parcel was ever part of a Zone A floodplain. The Zone A is, in an area, is an area that is subject to inundation by the 1% annual chance of a flood event. Because the detailed hydraulic analysis have not been performed, no base flood elevations or flood depths are shown in a Zone A floodplain. This requirement is needed to address the potential risk associated with parcels of land that were created during a time when parcels located in the Zone A were subdivided, but the hydraulic analysis were not performed. So what this means is that there are parcels out there with an un unknown risk, flood risk, uh, still in place. The way in which the proposed regulations address major subdivisions is a departure from the current standards. Currently, both major and minor subdivisions that include a flood hazard area are required to identify the flood hazard area and mitigate the hazard by using techniques such as building envelopes and no-build zones to keep structures and infrastructure out of the flood hazard area. This proposal maintains its standards for minor subdivision. This proposal maintains those standards for minor subdivisions, but for major subdivisions, this draft prohibits flood hazard areas from being included in any future lots that are designated for development. There are several reasons for using this approach, including the adoption of the standard will bring the county one step closer to achieving a better community rating systems rating from FEMA. The better rating provides a 5% reduction in flood insurance policies for all Missoula County residents that have a flood insurance policy. Additionally, the Water Quality District commented that this approach can help to protect riparian habitat often found within the flood hazard area. And lastly, our floodplain administrator, based on former and ongoing floodplain violations, pointed out that floodplain violations are most, more likely to occur when the flood hazard area is included in a developable lot as opposed to a non-developable lot. The last section of the proposed draft addresses those instances where the floodplain has been delineated, where no floodplain has been delineated, excuse me. This regulation is in our current standards, however, amendments are being proposed to reduce the criterion from area, for the criterion area from 15 square miles to five square miles. The reason for amending the standard is a recommendation received from the DNRC during our community assistance visit audit that suggested a reduction in the drainage criteria from 15 mi square miles to five square miles based on problems they have seen throughout the state from flooding related damages and small drainages. Uh, during our pre preliminary outreach on the first draft, st staff spent a good amount of time explaining the proposal to interested parties. During the formal comment period, CAPS provide, received two public comments on the draft regulations. Since the planning board hearing, CAPS has received one additional comment in support of these proposed regulations. And the comments can be found in attachment seven of your request for commission action. <clears throat> the planning board held a hearing on the proposed amendments on August 4th. The planning board discussion focused on several topics, including defensible space, the impacts of mitigation, and development of the flood hazard area in major subdivisions. Planning board passed a motion that would have retained the defensible space requirements for privately owned lots. Planning board members suggested that before the requirements are removed from the subdivision regulations, another regular, regulatory tool should be in place that address, addresses defensible space. Planning board failed to pass a motion that would have required analysis of the impacts of the proposed mitigation. There was also discussion regarding the prohibition of the flood hazard area within platted lots designated for development in major subdivisions. A couple of planning board members did not support the standards, but no motion was put forward to address their concerns. Finally, planning board did not forward a recommendation on this proposal. A motion was put forth to approve the proposal as amended by planning board, but the motion did not pass because of a 4-4 tie vote. So this concludes my presentation. In closing, staff is recommending approval of the adoption of the proposed amendments to section 3.13 hazardous lands. And the final resolution can be found in attachment six of the request for commission action. Oops. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. This is a public hearing. Is there comment? Are there questions? I'll close the hearing. So could I ask Todd to explain something? What are they talking about when they say five square miles and 15 square miles? 
Sure, this is Todd Cleats, Missoula County Floodplain Administrator. The 15 square mile area is the area that uh, the creek actually drains, so it's not 15 square miles of actual creek, but the drain, uh, the area up in the mountains from where it drains from. So it's, the, in other words, it kind of dictates how big the creek is and how much water it's going to Correct, how much water could potentially come down and cause flood. Mitch, could you just address really quickly the public comments um, by Mr. Sainert, Rocky Sainert, Rock. um, kind of what he's referring to? What? Yeah, as, as I saw um, Mr. Sainert's comments, um, I spoke with a few planners in our office to see if I could get some more background information on that subdivision, and I wasn't able to get any. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I guess in terms of the high pressure gas lines and things like that, some research we did to look into that was um, I, I called a few, excuse me, development companies, organizations to see how they look at high pressure gas lines and hazardous areas like that. And basically what they told me is that they do an on-site analysis and that there's some maps available when they're um, looking at those areas and so they you know they're they're very well known and I think they're mitigated for or actually maybe planned around as as developments planned and so um, that was some feedback I got from them okay so you don't feel like the, the language in the current regulations would cause illegal dwellings uh, you know or cause major changes to the way subdivisions are going to be I, I don't built to avoid illegal I, dwellings. I don't I don't foresee that now but what it would do is prevent um, people from living in, uh, I know there's some pretty big power lines out in that Clinton area, because I talked to someone who looked at a lot out there and it really had a large encumbrance from the utility easement. So if we put these regulations in place, it would prevent people from living under power lines and on top of gas lines and stuff in the future. I think. I mean, it's, this isn't going to stop anybody that's already got one they old grandfather in. Right. And that was one of the things that I noted with uh, Mr. Sennert's comments was that his subdivision was already platted and developed and things mm -hmm. like that. So. so we just wouldn't build it that way? We probably, now, maybe right? not. We'd probably not divide future. lots that might already exist there mm -hmm. further. I guess I'd just kind of like to talk out loud a little bit about the um, the proposal that in major subdivisions, um, the flood what is it floodplain or floodway that we're saying can't be floodplain. Floodplain um, couldn't be part of a lot. It would have to be part of a common area. I mean, I think there's pros and cons when you own land. You are more tempted to think you can put stuff. Um, on it because it's your property, but you also might be somebody who takes care of it better than a homeowners association that kind of fizzles out, which happens. Um, so maybe if you have some examples of where um, we have a case that, that makes sense for us to add this um, requirement, I'd like to hear it. I bet Todd might have them. Yeah. Address some of that. Um, I had talked with the CRS uh, coordinator at, at the national level about that. And when you uh, say CRS, tell me. A community rating system for, okay. for the FEMA community rating system, which is uh, one of the reasons that from floodplain that uh, we're supporting that. Um, we're trying to get from what's called a class 8 CRS rating to a class 7 rating and in order to do that we have to go above and beyond FEMA's minimums and the benefit to floodplain property owners is to get a reduction in flood insurance premiums from FEMA. Um, when I contacted the uh, gentleman in charge of the CRS program at FEMA, um, he had three specific bullet points that he wanted to bring across. One is that open space being preserved as dedicated open space parcels versus parts of individually developed lots is a lot easier to maintain and preserve in the long run by communities. 
open number two is open space as part of private owned lots can be effective, but it's more difficult to maintain, particularly as ownership changes. And number three, in addition, if parcels are totally open space, then more than likely no infrastructure such as driveways, roads, utilities are involved, reducing future flood losses. That's why FEMA gives communities that additional uh, reduction in flood insurance requirements. As far as some that we've actually experienced here locally, um, it kind of went through a couple of them, and some of them you uh, may be familiar with from recent, um, I, I won't name the property owner's names publicly, but Clark Fork Meadows out in Clinton, the Wallace Creeks Estates also near Clinton, Mullen Trail, uh, River Bottom Estates down in uh, down on the Bitterroot. All of those, while we had subdivision requirements preventing the structures from actually being in the floodplain, they did have uh, the lots extending down into the areas where our current resource and also down in the floodplain. And those are four um, specific ones that I believe are still on our uh, community. Uh, compl coordinated compliance list is ongoing issues that have been going on for three or four years now, uh, at least, uh, in trying to uh, gain compliance with those. So, yeah, some, some property owners are very good at maintaining their areas and some, create, uh, some inadvertently even create issues. I don't think anybody intentionally goes in and does things, but uh, then once they build in there or, or uh, alter those areas, it's hard to get the compliance back to how they were when the when they were approved by the commission to be left in a, in a particular state. So I see the other piece I see is that if someone happened to buy, I mean, sometimes these might be a larger piece of property, so in some ways we might inflict our uh, preservation of ag land. Some of those would be grazing properties. So you know, we've got ag land that we're going to be looking at pretty soon, and here we're talking about hazardous lands. I know that the riparian area isn't the best place to have a herd of cows, but all floodplain is a riparian, I guess. So, so I think, um, if I understand correctly, um, your concern is that maybe those areas wouldn't be able to be used for agricultural purposes. And I think that um, there is still the possibility for that. And one of the examples I think we use for um, how the property could be used as an agricultural lot. So I think that um, it still could be used for agricultural reasons. I don't think that there would be a limit there. I mean, I guess if it was subdivided such that there were several different owners, maybe that wouldn't work in that situation. But I understand what you're saying. Could you also address the public comment from Mr. John Haber? Um, and taking into account hazards from federal land, adjacent federal lands, and is that something that you saw good models for when you were researching, or kind of how well, is that addressed? Yeah, let me just pull up this comment here. If I recall correctly, he was concerned that um, there might be requirements to do some defensible space work on federal lands. Is that, I'm going to look yeah, I think it's there. that if you're adjacent to federal lands and they don't have defensible space, and so you can't create defensible space. It sounds like he's concerned about developing adjacent to federal land. Right, and so I, I think in response to his comment, I would say there's no requirements in here that's gonna force someone to do defensible space on someone else's property. Um, so if someone was adjacent to some federal lands, um, they wouldn't be required to provide defensible space on that federal land. Um, his other part about the uh, wildlife habitat and taking that into consideration. It's something similar to what Commissioner Curtis um, just mentioned with agricultural lands coming forward. I think as we develop all of these subdivision regulations, something we keep in mind is um, how they all work together. And so we have, you know, some of the um, proposed mitigation on agricultural lands, proposed mitigation on hazardous lands, possible proposed mitigation for wildlife habitat. And how is that when you Combine all that or compound it. How does that affect a property owner? And something it's something where we consider um, mm -hmm. when we're developing these regulations. Um, so you know we haven't developed the wildlife regulations yet, but I think we noted this specific comment is something we need to consider. You know, when, you do that. when we when we get to that point. And maybe I'm reading this in a different way, or then it doesn't sound to me like he's concerned about 
taking care of the federal lands. I think his con it sounds to me like his concern is that people shouldn't be able to develop really close to federal lands because of the lack of defensible space or mitigation ability. Mm. So I didn't know if there is a model of any like setbacks from federal lands that other or ha if if there's a way that other communities have tried to mitigate that or if that's just kind of a mm. your own risk thing where the feds don't maintain a defensible space. Yeah, I guess I didn't read it that way. Okay. And what I have seen um, in other communities is, you know, in, for some ex one example would be a green belt around an entire development. Um, that in itself has some impacts on wildlife and other right. things as well. And so those are some considerations we gave there. Um, so that was just one example I can think of off the top of my head. Okay. Um, and where do we intend on addressing the um, fire hazards as opposed to what, how we're not going to, we're taking out defensible space basically from, mm -hmm. from these, but we don't, we do have a plan for the future of, of how to address it? Um, I wouldn't, we don't have a plan in place in our work plan. I think that the uh, best approach would be probably a standalone ordinance, and that ordinance would incorporate um, all things wildland urban interface. So it would have a, a vegetation management section that would address basically defensible space for private lots, and it would read similar to, you know, a more urban ordinance that addresses, you know, weeds and other vegetation and things like that. Um, also included in that standalone ordinance would be your subdivision regulations. So basically what you do is have one document where everything's all contained. Um, I think that's kind of the best approach and that was a recommendation from the University of Montana Law Clinic as well from some work they did mm -hmm. for um, rural initiatives I guess in 2010. Some other approaches around are, you know, just having separate vegetation ordinances that say everyone in the county must do defensible space or something along those lines, um, where it's not all held within one document. So that's another approach too, but that kind of piecemealed approach um, doesn't lend itself to easy understanding for a landowner, so. Right, yeah, so I just, and I, I agree that um, the subdivision rigs aren't the place to address it, but I do completely understand the concerns of people on the planning board and other people in the community um, of taking it out and having nowhere else to put it. And so I definitely want to see that move forward and, and have defensible space put in somewhere in something. Um, did you get that email about the Fireways program? A member of the public sent it. I think I just got something today about that. It was Maybe interesting. Yes. I didn't know if that was intended for this project or if it was just a random letter that came to the commissioners, but I did but see it something did seem today. But it you know, address mm -hmm. fire hazards in a community right. and everything, so we could follow up on, you know, different ideas from that, too. And so, yeah. um, but I just want to make sure that, that that we allay the concerns of people who are fearful that it's coming out mm -hmm. um, and that we are going to, to address it somewhere. Yeah, I guess I would add, you know, from an enforcement perspective, which I did code enforcement for some time for the county, it is difficult to enforce defensible space requirements in perpetuity based on Absolutely. something that's included in someone's covenants. It's a real challenge. Um, anything after final plat is a real challenge to enforce. And so I think that approach of some sort of uh, vegetation ordinance, defensible space ordinance is probably the the best route to go for something like that. We have had, I should, you know, I should say we have had success in getting people to create a defensible space, but having them maintain maintain that defensible space is another another thing. Yeah, it's a full time job. Full time job. So it, a standalone ordinance would apply to all property, not just property that's gone through subdivision. Correct. That's the other. That's the other um, reason that a standalone ordinance would be probably more appropriate because, you know, we're only catching folks that are coming through in the subdivision process. We're not catching everyone in the county. And so mm -hmm. understanding how fire spreads and things like that, it's best to kind of address it on a larger scale. And enforcement is still going to be a problem. Yes. And what I've seen in other jurisdictions is that it's handled um, um, by a, uh, not just maybe one person, but a, a whole department, maybe a, a couple folks. It's also been handled by um, local uh, rural fire districts as well. And so there's a couple different ways to approach implementation and, and uh, things like that, so. So if we adopt these regulations and they have this floodplain piece under majors, is there enough flexibility that if a subdivision came forward and 
they made a strong case for why it should be done a different way, would we be able to do a variance? Well, we're not proposing to change the variance requirements at all, so they would still need to meet those those requirements so they could go through but that they process. Could, they could go through. And again, the, because planning board's motion failed, there aren't any planning board changes. There are no changes from planning board. They have no recommendation. Okay. So the motion is to adopt the resolution? Yeah, it's on the second page here. Hmm? I don't know. Is it your turn? I'll close the hearing, though, and we'll take a motion. Um. I move that the resolution to amend the Missoula County Subdivision Regulations be adopted effective November 2nd, 2015. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch, very much. Thanks. Any other business to come before the board? Any other business? Seeing none, we're in recess.